All right. So uh, our next speaker, um, I believe it doesn't really need presentation, but for those who doesn't know, he is the founder and the uh, the project lead for Drupal, and uh, he has been working on Drupal for over 20 years now. But later on, created uh, a co-founded Akia. Uh, so here is Dries, and he is going to be presenting um, or basically talking about tips and tricks uh, for building and growing a sustainable open source uh, community. So here we go. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. Um, good to see you all. Um, what I was going to do today um, is actually keep it fairly lightweight, I guess, and uh, talk a little bit about my journey uh, from starting Drupal to growing Drupal, and then using that story as a way to share some lessons learned. You know, things, lessons that we can apply to the modic community. So some of these lessons will be implicit. And then at the end of the presentation, I will also try to, you know, share some explicit lessons, if you will, to be really clear in a set of recommendations that I think would uh, benefit modic. So here we go. Um, I was also already introduced, uh, but I'm Dries. I started Drupal. I'm still the project lead for Drupal. Been doing that for like 20 years, really. And I started Acquia, I co-founded Acquia, and I'm the chief technology officer, so responsible for product and product marketing, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you don't know Drupal, Drupal is an open source content management system. It's one of the largest communities or open source communities in the world. We power about you know two to three percent of all of the websites in the world. And if you look in the enterprise segment of the web, it's actually um, like ten percent of all of the larger enterprise websites. Um, as I mentioned, I also co-founded Acquia. I won't go into the details here, but uh, Acquia has grown uh, quite a bit. Uh, we're over a thousand employees, and uh, we keep growing. We keep growing in in terms of COVID nineteen as well. And our vision and mission is to be an open source digital experience company. And so that's why, um, you know, one of the reasons why we are, uh, you know, we were proud to acquire uh, Modic Inc., for example. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, what I want to do next is going to take you through some of the details, I guess, of my journey as an open source contributor and, I guess, a leader in the open source world. And then, as I mentioned, uh, talk about a few kind of lessons learned or key takeaways, if you want, that I think are specifically relevant to uh, Modic today. So let's get started. <laughs> um, this is me uh, in 2001. Uh, it's me in my dorm room in Belgium, in Antwerp specifically. It's where I was born and raised. And uh, I studied computer science. And as you can see, I you know am or was <laughs> uh, a little bit of a nerd, you know, I loved my assembly books. I loved my chessboard at a stamp collection, compiler books, uh, all of these things. So I'm a techie by nature, I guess. I was, you know, professionally trained as a software developer. And uh, I decided to start Drupal because, um, you know, just wanted to have some fun, I guess, with, uh, at the time, PHP and MySQL being sort of new technologies. And I figured I would uh, spend a few nights uh, working on a message board that we could use uh, in my dorm. And, uh, you know, that couple of nights that I was planning to spend on Drupal um, on that message board, you know, spiraled sort of out of control, <laughs> if you will. And 20 years later, I'm still working uh, on Drupal. So, uh, so when I started Drupal, I guess there wasn't sort of a, a master plan. It, it was started by accident. Um, now, the first few years, I was working on Drupal mostly by myself, to be honest. And, and by 2003, we had a number of contributors. And at the same time, something pretty cool happened that really helped launch uh, Drupal. And that was, you know, Howard Dean. He was a presidential candidate in the United States. 
he had picked Drupal as the basis of his online campaign platform. Now, back in 2003, no presidential candidate used the internet to campaign. All right, so Dean Space, this platform is truly groundbreaking, and it actually led to Howard Dean, who was sort of not a top candidate, to get quite far in the election process. And so the result of that is that there's a lot of press and media attention on this campaign platform and, and how Howard Dean was doing things uh, very differently than uh, other candidates. Um, and so obviously there was articles in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Time Magazine, and they would all mention, you know, Dean Space's platform. And, you know, from time to time, Drupal would get like a little reference. They would say, oh, oh, by the way, built on Drupal. So it was, it was never really about Drupal, but the fact that we were basically, you know, at the core of this platform got us some great media attention and, and actually changed the way other presidential candidates in the next round of elections, you know, did campaigning. So by 2008 or the 2008 election, so 2007, 2008, pretty much every presidential candidate had a campaign platform built on Drupal, which was pretty cool. And what happened is that it really resulted in a boost of adoption for Drupal and a lot of people paying attention. And so in 2005, I decided to organize uh, or to help organize the very first DrupalCon. And I organized it in Antwerp. As I mentioned, that's where I was living. And, you know, about 30 people showed up. And for me, that was like crazy. Like <laughs> I couldn't imagine like 30 people traveling to Antwerp to talk about Drupal. And the reason is because, you know, up until that point, it was mostly me and myself. I was working on Drupal at nights, on the weekends. I wouldn't really talk to my friends about it, to be honest, or my family. It was just something that I did for fun in my spare time. And so when all these people came to Belgium and we decided to spend a whole week talking about Drupal, I, I couldn't quite <laughs> grasp that uh, or understand that. So. But for us, that first time that we got together was really, really valuable and created real camaraderie to the point that some of the people um, on this photo um, are still involved with Drupal all these years later. Like we created a friendship um, and then other people may not have been involved with Drupal anymore, but they've went on to do some pretty cool things. Like you see Chris Messina on this photo, he ended up creating the hashtag <laughs> as an example. Uh, and there's a couple of other examples of people that went on to do pretty cool things and great things for the web uh, in general. But 2005, that first DrupalCon, that was a pretty big milestone for us. Um, now, up until that point, we were emailing patches for the most part. Like people would send me an email and they would attach a patch and I would apply the patch and commit it to CVS, to our source control system. And at some point we decided to invest in better tooling. And so by 2005, we actually launched what we call the project system in Drupal, which is sort of a GitHub before GitHub. And that was a real game changer for us because we could have different kinds of projects, you know, contributed modules or plugins and each of those projects would have his issue queue where people could file bugs or upload patches rather than emailing patches in an email mailing list. And so that was a big milestone too because it allowed us to collaborate. It created a participation platform. And still to this day, Drupal.org has a pretty amazing you know, project tool uh, we get like 2 million unique visitors to Drupal.org every month, which is kind of a crazy number. And we have about 10,000 or so active contributors, uh, most of them contributing code. And we still use this system today. Obviously, it has evolved a lot. But still today, it has capabilities and features that GitHub or GitLab doesn't have and that allow us to really scale the development 
to you know thousands of active contributors, um, which may be hard to do still on you know GitHub or GitLab you know, at that scale. Uh, but that was a big game changer. This notion of installing the right tools and processes that come with these tools for the Drupal community to be successful and be able to scale. And I think Modic, <clears throat> as a young project, has done a great job establishing some tools as well. I think it's really important if you want to grow uh, open source projects, right? And so that was a pretty important milestone for us. Now, by 2005, more and more people had come to Drupal and Drupal.org to the point that our server, the server that ran Drupal.org literally kind of melted. <laughs> I, uh, I shifted a lot of my time from actually contributing to Drupal to helping to scale our infrastructure. Now, I was a student at the time um, and you know, I didn't have any money. <laughs> so basically the drupal.org website was running on a shared uh, shell account is what we called it back in the day, which meant that, um, you know, I, I got a little bit of server space from a friend's server. And so when all of these people came to our site, drupal.org, that stopped working. And at some point we had no choice but to buy a new server. And so, as a student, not having any money, the only thing that I could come up with was to replace every page of Drupal.org with a blank page. And on that blank page, there was a PayPal button. And that button said, you know, please, or below the button, it said, please give us some money. We need to upgrade the server. And once we have enough money, I did some back of the envelope calculation. And I think we said like $3,000 we could buy this kick-ass server. And uh, I said, once we have enough money, you know, we'll get the site back up and running, <laughs> which sounds kind of crazy, but something really amazing happens. Like within 24 hours, we had collected $10,000, like hundreds of people contributed money. And all of a sudden, we had way more money <laughs> than we ever needed. and I, I never had $10,000 in my life. And so I panicked and uh, I changed the PayPal password to be like this long, you know, like huge password because I was afraid somebody would steal the money. And so PayPal blocked my account. They said suspicious traffic uh, because in the first like four years of Drupal or five years of Drupal, that maybe collected, you know, $50, like a very small amount of money in that PayPal account. And all of a sudden, in like 24 hours or less, we had $10,000. And so I had to deal with PayPal so they would unblock my account. Um, something else happened. Sun Microsystems, which I'm sure many of you remember Sun, but it was a sort of premier hardware software company, invented Java and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the CTOs emailed me and said, hey, we've been using Drupal, I've been paying attention to Drupal. I'm going to send you a server. <laughs> and they actually ended up shipping like a $7,000 Sun server that kind of literally showed up uh, like a few days later. And so here we are, we have $10,000. We actually have a server uh, that's worth $7,000. Um, and then one more thing happens, the OSL or the open source lab part of the University of Oregon, they said, hey, if you have a server, we are willing to host it for free. We're willing to pay for electricity, bandwidth, and oh, by the way, we have all these students that could work on you know, maintaining the server and upgrading the software for you. And so that was pretty, pretty amazing. Like within 24 hours, you know, we had all of that. And so it was early signs, I think, of what a great community we were building. It really felt like we were onto something. And it was very, very nice to see all of these people come to help. And so one of the things that we did is we created this poster. And you can see part of the poster on the screen. Um, and on the logo, the Druplicon logo, we added all of the names of the people that chipped in money 
to help you know buy new servers <laughs> and so we would take that poster and take it around the world when there was drupal events we would put it on the walls as a thank you to remind people of all of the people that contributed um but i think one of the lessons for me looking back is that it was amazing to see how you know we started to create a real community of people willing to contribute um but the other lesson was kind of like things don't have to always go perfect sometimes it's these moments of difficulty where you're struggling to do something that are actually the most powerful moments or the most influential or shaping moments if our server hadn't gone down maybe we wouldn't have kind of had that trigger to come together and help the project right and so i think looking back there's been many of these moments where it was maybe difficult to get something done but those are the moments that really make a community stronger going through moments of change like that um and of course now um in 2020, uh, looking back, this was such a simple problem. Whereas at the time, it looked like the biggest problem, like coming up with $3,000 as a student was a very big problem. Uh, but now, of course, the Drupal project is so large that if we needed $3,000 for a server, we would you know, have it in half a day or less, right? Um, and so that's another lesson in a way, like as you get bigger, the problems ahead of you always feel like bigger problems and problems you can solve. And looking back, the problems look kind of easy. Now by 2006, um, you know, more amazing things happened and all of these larger companies, famous companies like MTV, you know, I grew up in the era of MTV, but MTV.com switched to Drupal as an example, and it was for me, it was hard to believe <laughs> that all of these companies would adopt uh, Drupal. And uh, at the time I was actually, I went back to college and I did a PhD in computer science, but I would spend my evenings and nights trying to help these companies be successful with Drupal because MTV switched to Drupal and literally <laughs> their site came down crashing, uh, like it didn't scale. And so, I offered to help them and so free of charge, I didn't, I did it for fun. Like I didn't do it to get paid and I didn't get paid. I would be on the conference call with, you know, engineers or the team behind mtv.com and it would help them figure out how to make the website work, right? And I think for me, looking back, that's also a very important lesson. Like you have to really help make your users successful. Like that's really what drives, you know, customer success and user success is what drives the adoption of a project. And actually that belief led me to co-found Acquia. And so at the time I went and actually visited, I traveled um, to California and I invited myself to meet with sort of people that were ahead of me, people that had started open source businesses or had scaled open source projects. Like I met with, um, Larry Augustin, who started uh, VA Linux and took it public, for example. I met with Red Hat, MySQL, JBoss, and even emailed, I uh, didn't meet him, but I emailed with, you know, Leland Storvalds and I asked them, what do I do, right? And they were all very willing to help me. And, you know, as a result, I came up with the idea to start a company around Drupal, you know, a company that would be to Drupal um what red hat was to linux let's say at the time that was the business model uh, commercial support and so we started a company called aquia you know together with jay batson uh, we both met we both had the same kind of vision or ended up with the same vision i should say to start a company around drupal that would provide commercial support and so in 2007 we started uh, aquia and aquia really helped grow drupal um, at the time, I was still in Belgium, at least for the beginning. Uh, but then eventually, um, you know, after raising money, um, decided to, you know, move to the United States. Um, but something else happened. In 2009, 
um, I was invited to visit the White House. And at the time, you know, US government had adopted a whole bunch of websites uh, or had used Drupal for a whole bunch of websites. One of them was actually recovery.gov, which some of you may or may not recall, but, um, you know, the president at the time actually created uh, a stimulus bill, you know, I guess not too dissimilar to what's happening right now. I think it was 800 billion, which was very large at the time. And one of the cool things that they did is they actually tracked every dollar spent. And so for every dollar of that 800 billion, you could see what project it belonged to, was the project on track, off track, who owns the project, how many projects does that person own, how many of them are off track. So it was kind of radical transparency in how that stimulus money was spent. And so, you know, went to the White House, put on my suit, <laughs> went to the White House and expected that we would be talking about recovery.gov or some other project. But instead, like five minutes into the conversation, they asked about, you know, what about whitehouse.gov? Could whitehouse.gov run on Drupal? And I think on the inside, <laughs> I kind of panicked, but on the outside, I said like, sure, we can do that. And so we ended up um, helping whitehouse.gov to run their Drupal site which for Drupal was huge. Like the amount of credibility that whitehouse.gov gave the Drupal community changed everything. Uh, it led to so many more users adopting Drupal because people would say, well, if it works for the White House, it will work for me. At the time, 2009, let's not forget, people were still on the fence about open source. You know, People were like, I don't know if it's secure. I don't know if it will scale. Um, and obviously, you know, White House, the White House.gov website is actually, you know, one of the top 10 websites in the federal government in the US. They have like 40,000 sites or something in the federal government. And 10 of those are considered to be mission critical, are not allowed to go down ever. Uh, and so the fact that they adopted Drupal for, you know, one of the top 10 most critical websites within the government in the US give us huge credibility, right? Like somebody would come to us and they would say, ah, I don't know if Drupal is secure enough. I don't know if it's scalable enough. I think we would just point them to whitehouse.gov and they would say, oh, all right, well, I guess it's good enough for us then. Uh, and so that really helped. Now, on top of that, um, the Obama administration also used Drupal as an incredible innovation platform. And, and one of the things that they did is we the people basically is a big voting platform, if you will. And anyone could submit an idea, others could vote on it. And um, if it reached a certain vote, um, you know, the, uh, you know, President Obama, I guess, or his, his team made a formal commitment to look into the proposal and give a formal response. And it actually led to a whole bunch of changes. Um, like for example, in the US, cell phones were bundled with um, with plans. Like you could only, you know, you had to buy the cell phone with the plan. You couldn't buy a cell phone separate from the plan. And that was one of the things people petitioned for because this was a petition platform and actually led to the unbundling of these things. I mean, there was so many examples um, of things that we, the people did all driven by Drupal as the underlying platform. Um, there's also a couple of fun ones. Um, you can see what, what it looked like at the time. Of course, today, none of that exists anymore. Um, it was all taken down by the next administration. I can see a couple of these things here um, of what people petitioned for and the number of signatures it got. Uh, I think at some point they had to increase the threshold to like 50,000 signatures because there was so much volume that they couldn't keep up. It was very successful. Um, you know, one f funny story uh, is that somebody petitioned for the U.S. government to build the uh, Dead Star. <laughs> um, and of course, the Internet wouldn't be the Internet or, um, you know, it would collect like I forgot how many petitions, like over 30,000 or something petitions, which triggered the obligation <laughs> for the, you know, the, the, the presidency to respond and so they did respond <laughs> and uh, funny enough the response you can see it here they said why would we build the death star 
it actually costs, I don't even know what that is, $850 trillion. <laughs> and we're working hard to reduce the deficit, not expand it. They said the administration doesn't support blowing up planets. And my favorite is this one, actually. Like, why would we build it if it can actually be destroyed by a one-man starship? <laughs> so I kind of love that as a story. But uh, all of that really helped you know, give credibility to Drupal and, and was a great fun time uh, to be part of. As I mentioned, I moved to Boston from Belgium. Acquia was really taken off. Drupal was really taken off. And also by then, 2011, DrupalCon had grown really big. Like we were doing multiple Drupal cons each year and they would attract like 3,200 people, right? <laughs> and uh, I remember this one in Chicago. Um, where we uh, had to find a venue and we went to Chicago. We went to the Sheraton Hotel, as you can see. Um, I'll do that again. Uh, the Sheraton Hotel in Chicago. And we, we, you know, we asked them, like, what does it take to rent the whole hotel? Because we're having DrupalCon. And I forgot what they said, but probably was something like $1.5 million. <laughs> and we said, we'll take it. And so we basically rented out the Sheraton uh, Hotel um, in Chicago, we called it the Drupal Tower. It was run over by Drupal people and it was pretty amazing. Like, again, the community that we had built and that we still have, um, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun um, with these events. Like, for example, when you checked into the conference, you got a little bag with, you know, a schedule, some promotion. But in it, we also put... Drupal pajamas. So everybody got Drupal pajamas, <laughs> which was kind of cool. And you could literally walk into the lobby of the hotel at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. In the lobby, you would find dozens of people wearing their Drupal pajamas, riding coat. You know, um, we have lots of great stories like that. Uh, meanwhile, I also kept, um, you know, growing Acquia. By the time we had raised, um, I think like $180 million, a lot of that money we actually invested back in Drupal. We really um, you know, created multiple initiatives around usability, ease of use, scalability, and Acquia helped drive many, not all of the initiatives, but many of the initiatives we really helped uh, coordinate, which you know, helped Drupal grow. Um, Customers got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, NBC Sports switched all of their websites to Drupal. Nestle moving like thousands of websites to Drupal. And the New York Stock Exchange adopted Drupal. And you can see, it's kind of hard to see, but in the middle, you actually see a Drupal sign taking over a new, uh, Times Square in New York. <laughs> like that was the CIO of NASDAQ that was on stage at our event. and. Uh, just for fun, <laughs> he uh, they put a big Drupal banner on you know one of the big buildings or billboards that you you all seen those billboards I'm sure, um, and that was live from his presentation. He would kind of stream, uh, you know, he would show New York Times Square live from his keynote, and it would and it showed sort of the Drupal logo and signage, which was you know pretty cool. Anyway, lots of organizations adopt. Drupal, as I mentioned, out of 10 or so sites in the enterprise running Drupal uh, by now. And then in 2019, we, uh, you know, Acquia started to acquire, um, you know, different companies to build out our vision for what the company would be. And obviously, one of the companies that we acquired was, was Modic Inc. And it was a big part of our vision because we felt that what we had done for content management and how we disrupted the whole content management industry, um, or I should say how open source disrupted the whole content management industry, not just Drupal, but obviously WordPress and Joomla, Typo3, and other content management systems. It's not a lot of companies that buy a content management system today, to be honest, right? You, most people start with an open source solution. Um, we felt the opportunity to repeat that, to run that playbook, so to speak, of open source disrupting a large market, we felt that um, the same could be done with marketing automation, frankly. And you know, 
Modic was sort of the only marketing automation platform in town. And I was actually very bullish about Modic from day one. I actually met DB uh, Hurley, you know, way back when. Um, and when he started Modic, I ended up being a very small, tiny uh, seed investor uh, in Modic because I believed so much in Modic before Modic was even started, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so eventually, you know, one thing or another led to Acquia acquiring, you know, Modic Inc. And so, um, you know, we believe in the future of Modic. We believe in the future of open source or an open marketing cloud and marketing automation. Um, so we are we are very excited about that. And we think there's a lot of things that we've learned from Drupal and how we helped grow Drupal and how we helped build a commercial ecosystem around Drupal. Uh, a lot of these things we believe we can help, you know, Modic with. And so in the first year, it's been a, over a little over a year, I guess, um, year and a half maybe since we acquired Modic. Uh, we've been focused on working with the community to put in place a better governance model to help evolve the release management system. Um, we helped release Modic 3. You know, some of the engineers on the Modic team at Acquia helped contribute to that and will continue to contribute and help where we think uh, we can add value without trying to, you know, we're not trying to manage the community. We want the community to, to do its thing. Um, but we want to be, uh, you know, a significant participant in the community. And I think uh, we put the governance model in place um, that will allow us and help us to do that, but also allow others to lead and take key leadership roles in, in the project. Um, and then in 2019, later in that year, Acquia itself um, sort of got acquired uh, by a company called Vista Equity Partners. And as a result of that, we've continued to invest um, in, in more and different technologies. All right, so kind of a long story so far, but um, let's kind of talk about where we are today. So obviously, actually just today uh, on my blog, I announced that Acquia has now switched from Marketo to Modic, um, which is a big deal for us um, because you know, Marketo, you know, we're a large-ish company. We're larger than most companies at IPO, as an example. Like, we're over a 1,000 people, a uh, fast-growing company. Like, Marketo is at the core of our marketing operations and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue depend on Marketo, <laughs> right? It's at the core of that engine and so it took us a while, but we managed to now switch to uh, Modic or what we call Campaign Studio. That's how we uh, bring Modic to market in the in the world of Acquia as a SaaS solution. Uh, so we switched to Cam Acquia Campaign Studio, which is basically Modic. Uh, and we're very proud that we are now sort of off Marketo. <laughs> um, in the process, we had to do a whole bunch of work. I can talk about that if you want, but it was um, it was a lot of connectors that were missing that we needed, and so we had to build a whole bunch of things. Um, a bunch of those will contribute back um, if we haven't already, uh, but we're very proud of that. It's a big milestone for us as a company to actually switch to Modic, and I think it gives the Modic community a great reference. Uh, actually, I work for Acquia, and companies our size, um, hopefully other companies in the world will look at that and say, all right, if it works for Acquia, it will work for me, right? And obviously, I think we should find bigger and better examples too. Um, but I think Acquia will be another great reference uh, for the Modic project. Um, anyway, this is a, an Acquia slide, but we've continued to move up and to the right with Gartner and Forrester being recognized as a leader in the digital experience platform market. We're kind of the in the top three um, together with Adobe and Sitecore. So open source is fighting like David and Goliath fighting the big battle against some 
of the largest technology companies in the world, right? We're in this magic quadrant, in this Forrester wave, next to companies like IBM and Oracle and Adobe and Salesforce. So we're fighting the good fight, I believe. And, you know, Modic is an essential part of that. Meanwhile, the Drupal community continues to do really well. Um, there's a lot of passionate contributors, as I mentioned, every year we have about 10,000 people that contribute. Um, every year we have 1,200 or so companies that contribute. Um, and, you know, we continue to be a healthy, growing, innovative community and uh, trying to share some of the lessons learned with other open source projects like Modic. All right. So a couple of key takeaways, I think, if I kind of abstract that a little bit. First thing I'll say is, um, you know, overnight successes are at least <laughs> 10 years in the making. I think about how long it took for Drupal to be truly on the map, so to speak, for Drupal to be at a point where, you know, a lot of web developers knew about Drupal. I would say that took about 10 years. I really do think 10 years was kind of when Drupal started to become more visible and where our growth really started to take off. And the same thing is true for Acquia. Like Acquia now is 14 years old and it took us 10 years to really kind of get to that place where we were recognized as a key player in our market. And so I think the lesson is that it takes time to build something that has high impact and not a lot of people know about. It will take Modic 10 years to be on the map as a recognizable uh, force, you know, before people will start switching from, let's say, Marketo to Modic in large amounts. And so it's important that you keep building that you keep investing and that you're patient builders and investors uh, in the Modic platform because the success will come if you do it right and you innovate, you make the platform better and better, the success will come. But it does take 10 years. And after 10 years, it may feel like an overnight success. People will come out of nowhere and say, wow, this Modic thing is awesome. How did we get here? Um, and why didn't I know about it last year? How did they came out of nowhere? So overnight success, in my mind, takes at least 10 years. And that 10 years is, is true for many other things. Like if you think about your own education, I mean, you go to school for like 12 years, right? So you, again, it's kind of that same kind of 10 plus chunk of time that you need to invest before you become really good at something. All right, so that's lesson one. Lesson two, I have only four lessons and then I'll do questions and answers. Is two is that governance isn't a bad word. When I speak to people in the open source community, sometimes they don't like the notion of processes or a governance structure, but I personally believe it's really important to put it in place because it will make things so much easier, like it allows you to scale. It allows you to give leadership roles to many people, to put people in charge of initiatives and projects. And if you were in uh, in, in, Ruth, uh, in Ruth's uh, session, I don't know how many sessions <laughs> she had today, but in the main session uh, where she talked about the future of Modic, you can see, uh, you could hear that we have a lot of structure now. And you know, Ruth and the team did an amazing job thinking about the roadmap and initiatives and how we will appoint initiative leads and that kind of stuff, right? Release managers, all of that is now in place. Um, we still have to fill in, so to speak, names in the roles and that kind of stuff, but this will really set us up to collaborate and innovate together as a community and to go faster together than the project has ever gone before. So really important, I think. Um, now the job is to help encourage people to take on these leadership roles and to find ways for them that they can commit the sort of the time and effort, whether it's 
through sponsorship or other mechanisms, right? Um, third lesson is kind of like find your White House. <laughs> I think, um, you know, reference customers or reference end users really drive adoption. Like you can grow things by pushing, if you will, but the real magic happens when there is a pull from the market, when people start to adopt your tool. And it's a very different feeling than when you're trying to push something. Um, and I think what creates that pull is having large organizations or well-known organizations or relevant organizations or inspiring organizations, maybe they're small, but really inspiring, adopt Modic in a way that others go like, whoa, what just happened there? Let's take notice. Because then once you have these examples, everybody in the Modic community will start using them. For example, when White House switched to Drupal, I can guarantee you that the hundreds of Drupal shops that exist in the world, every single one of them, every single one of them would say, did you know White House at Golf uses Drupal? And it would change every customer conversation. And it creates that pull from the market to the tool. And that's how you get thousands of people to contribute, right? So my advice would be try and find those organizations that are willing to switch and maybe invest in that just like how I invested in helping MTV be successful. Because once you have a reference like that, it pays itself back in terms of getting more organizations uh, involved. All right. And the last lesson is reward your makers. And I'm not gonna go into the details here, but I wrote a, a long blog post about this last year which probably will take you 30 minutes to read. You can see the URL on the on the slide here. But um, what I mean by that is it's important to, first of all, embrace sort of commercial ecosystem around Modic. The fact that people are starting businesses to implement Modic is awesome. You need that. Some of those businesses will be makers meaning they will start to contribute back to Modic because they recognize that their business depends on the success of Modic. And as they find gaps or bugs, they will contribute features and bug fixes back to the Modic project. That's often driven by a notion of doing the right thing. Maybe it's rewarding, um, but that's great. That's what you want, right? You want those organizations to contribute when they can. But most organizations will most likely not contribute. They are what I call takers. They just take the software and don't contribute. Now, that is their right. I'm not saying it's wrong. Um, it's okay. But I think what is important is that you recognize and reward the makers that those that contribute the most, you give the most visibility, the most benefits, because that's how you scale that kind of contribution. If it becomes more interesting to contribute, more and more organizations will contribute. And it's a flywheel effect, because if you create visibility for those that contribute the most, they will only contribute more. You know, it's how you scale contribution uh, and especially sponsored contribution, which in the long run will be very important today. For example, in Drupal, more than two thirds or a little bit more than two thirds of all of the contribution is sponsored, meaning less, a little bit less than one third of the contribution comes from, you know, volunteers. Um, and I think that's very typical for larger open source projects where more and more of the contribution becomes, you know, commercially sponsored contribution. So you need to put in place systems that help you reward makers and actually try not to reward takers. Um, long story, we can talk about that more in the questions or I can give another presentation about that at a future, uh, you know, Modicon. But 
Um, you know, these are my four lessons. Um, and, if, and I hope that throughout this presentation, I was able to share some ideas, some lessons learned, both implicit and explicit, as I mentioned. But um, thanks for listening. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. If you want to subscribe to my blog, you can too. I'm happy to share the slides of my presentation and maybe the recording as well. Uh, so if you want to get your hands on that, feel free to subscribe. And with that, I think we can switch to Q&A. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yes, I was saying that was, uh, that was, uh, it was uh, quite a journey uh, to get here. Yeah. Uh, with the, with the, the, the Drupal community and, uh, and all, I mean, basically Drupal has to go through along with you guys and everybody who was involved and uh, the entire community, basically. So that's uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, so right a lot of now, people were involved. Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Very, it's a huge community. And that's, that's one thing that is uh, very, I mean, uh, it's one of the, the, the feature that I like about the mm -hmm. open source community. It's it's the way, the, the very easy way that people just gather together and 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 they they go for this one idea and they, they just fight for it, you know. Um very interesting. We do not have let me check right now. No uh, questions. No questions so far. So that's what All I was right. gonna I was gonna check. If there's any questions, ask away. You can ask me about anything, actually. It doesn't have to be about a presentation. Maybe there's something I didn't cover that you want me to um, to talk about. I'm more than happy to. So yes, if uh, anyone has any questions at all. OK, so we just have one question from Ono. So he said, uh, first of all, big thanks to Driz for this session. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, in your opinion, what big feature is still missing in Maori? Mm. In other words, where should we focus uh, uh, on the next 10 years? Yeah, that's just a small question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I can only answer a question through my lens, right? So. Um, and that is through the lens of Acquia. And so obviously at Acquia, we sell sort of um, the Modic cloud is, is kind of what, how to think about it, right? So we have a cloud hosted version of Modic that we call Campaign Studio. And what I see the most through that lens is a couple of things. One is um, the need for some, let's call it usability improvements specifically with the email builder and the landing page builder. Um, some of our customers report that those are um, not easy to use and then don't necessarily work the way they expect it to work. That's one thing that we see. And then the other thing that I would say is, I'd call it sort of the enterprise readiness is an area that I think we can focus on. So obviously, Acquia sells into large users, customers. We're focused mm -hmm. on the enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have successfully sold um, sort of the Modic Cloud or Campaign Studio to a number of famous companies that everybody would know. I don't know if I can talk about their names right now. <laughs> but they have a lot of profiles. They have a lot of events. Um, and we've definitely had to, you know, we've definitely run into some scalability issues, you know, okay. all things we were able to fix. But um, I think, um, you know, as 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 Modic, as we get more of these bigger customers, I think we'll we'll overcome more and more of these scalability issues, which I think is very normal. So, oh, yeah. um, I would say for me, these are the two things that are top of mind, sort of. Buckets of usability work that, you know, specifically around the email builder and then pockets of scalability 
work where maybe the system becomes a little bit slower than customers expect. Now, for the most part, customers love Modic. They love the, I don't know what it's officially called actually, but the journey builder capability, is that the name? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's been very successful, I think. Um, a lot of companies want to get off some of these proprietary platforms, you know, and take control and have freedom over how they can integrate, what they can integrate with, have control over their own data. I think the story definitely resonates. And I think it's a matter of time for Modic to grow and become more successful and, you know, will make the platform better along the way. You know, that's how software is built. We evolve it and evolve it to become better and better and better. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And along that line, uh, um, Floris has a question. Uh, uh, he said, uh, we have seen a great sum of successes uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Drupal, Mautic, and Akia. Uh, so basically the question is, what do you think the next step is to have open source fully covered in the heads of corporations? So that's why uh, you started talking about the uh, enterprise and adopting it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think if I look back 20 years ago or 10 years ago, there was a lot of uncertainty around open source. Absolutely. Like how could it work when it's built by, mm -hmm. between quotes, random people all around the world? <laughs> you know, how is it secure? Yeah. And uh, I think most of these concerns today are gone. Um, so I think, I mean, I know very few developers that wake up in the morning thinking, what proprietary software will I buy today? <laughs> you know, if like, I think open source is a starting point for most. And so I think for open source to be fully covered, if, if I reuse Flores's words, I think one, it's about innovating fast and closing competitive gaps, right? Because proprietary software still has some feature advantages often. So I think that's, you know, important to close these competitive gaps. Uh, and then it's about making it easy to adopt software. So obviously corporations want to adopt it in the easiest way possible or with the least risk possible and fast. And, it, and fast, right? And so if you have two pieces of software, the one, and, and they both fulfill the job, they do the job that needs to be done, mm -hmm. the one, the one piece of software that will get adopted is the one that's the easiest <laughs> to, uh, you know, that that will be the one that gets adopted the most. So then it becomes about ease of use, speed of adoption, time to value, risk mitigation. And I think that's where open source needs that commercial ecosystem. That's what the companies in the modic community will help with. You know, they'll make it yeah. safer, easier, and faster to adopt. Okay. Yeah, from Mahmoud. Thank you, Dries, for all the information you shared today. So, how Acquia acquired Mautic and is still open source? Um, what was the question? How did we acquire Mautic and and it's still open source? Yes. <laughs> so, well, Mautic was two things in a way. There was a community, and there was a company called Mautic or Mautic Inc. And um, we acquired Mautic Inc. The company. Um, and, you know, that company had, you know, various assets like the trademark for Modic, these kinds of things. So that is what we acquired. Like we can't really acquire a community. <laughs> and so our goal is to help grow and foster the community and to be, you know, good shepherds, you know, and contributors. Like, you know, like we know how that works from the Drupal community. Like we have been a top contributor to Drupal for 14 years and yeah. We know that relationship with an open source community based on yeah. an experience. So we want to kind of do the same, you know, we want to be a top contributor to Modic and we want to help the Modic community and the product Modic be successful. Yeah. So from Pierina, Pierina, sorry if I pronouncing the wrong name wrong, uh, best practices and tips, um, you know, are efficient when rewarding contributors to encourage more contrib contributions when it comes to the open source community? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't think there is one thing, but a lot of people like the recognition. Like if you're an individual, a person, like you like to be recognized for your contribution, that's often rewarding for people, right? Very human. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, so, you know, 
try to find ways to reward people, whether it's on profile pages or in shout outs or email or events like this, where you can say, hey, here are all the people that contributed and mm -hmm. special thank you to these and these people. Uh, similarly, organizations that contribute or sponsor people to contribute, they also like <laughs> a recognition and you know their motivations are slightly different. Like at the end of the day, a company wants leads, right? They want to get more business. Mm -hmm. And so if you contribute uh, as a company and you get recognized for that too, in a way that you get more visibility on, um, you know, in the modic community and that leads to more business, that creates a flywheel of, you know, fueling more contribution. So. I think there's many different ways to look at this, but I would encourage you to read the post, uh, Makers and Takers, I forgot the exact name, but um, if you go to my blog, which is Dries, D-R-I dot E-S, you can find it there. And uh, I um, include various examples of things you can do. Okay. So another one uh, from Yuli. Thanks for inspiring us. Um, as you mentioned, governance, uh, in your opinion, what's most important to consider? Uh, how do you get people on board and where do you need uh, to act sensitively? Uh, what do you recommend, basically? Yeah, I think uh, it always looks harder to get people on board, I think. But in, in reality, I think the best thing you can do is ask. Um, I, I've learned that, like, it's not in people's nature to kind of raise their hand and say, I want to help and do this. Yeah. Like it's, pe there's barriers. People are maybe, they don't feel like they could do it or they're, you know, they don't feel like they're good enough to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Absolutely. what I've learned is that if you ask a person, if you are a leader in the project and you ask, hey, would you like to be the head of the security team? just to name a random example, people will be like, whoa, yes, of course, I feel honored. And, you know, like just asking opens yeah. a lot of doors and people can say no, and that's fine, right? But a lot of people will say yes. And then once they feel that ownership, whether it's over the security team, something else, and a plugin, an extension, an aspect of the project, very often people will do an incredible job because they feel a sense of responsibility and ownership. So the biggest thing I think you can do is create clarity on where you need help and then go around and ask people, yeah. do you, is any of this of interest to you? We would love help. Do you mind helping with this or do you mind helping with that? And I think the simple act of asking is one of the most important and powerful things to do. Okay. So he asked, uh, where do you need to uh, to act sensitively? Basically, do you have, do you usually go for something specific or you just kind of like throw I it think out? If, you, if you can be specific, it's helpful. Okay. Um, you know, you should be very clear about where you need help, the initiatives you're trying to launch, what kind of people you need for the initiative. Yeah. Um, and then ask. Uh, it gives it gives an idea as well for the person to know exactly right. uh, what they. We've done so many things in Drupal to help people get involved, but it's still hard for people to get involved. <laughs> people <laughs> will always feel a little bit overwhelmed. Will always doubt themselves. Yeah. Will always, you know, it's hard to get involved. You know, think about how many things you get involved with. <laughs> um, sure. You know, just out of the blue, right? Yeah. It's usually not a lot of things that you kind of self nominate and get involved. <laughs> but if yeah. somebody asks you, chances are you're going to say, yes, I can help with that. Okay. So for the last question, uh, Piyush asking, if you were to move again, where would you move to from Boston? <laughs> That's funny. You know what? There are so many cool places in the world. that It's a hard thing. But I think Australia to me sounds pretty awesome. Okay. I've been to Australia three, four times, and every time I had an amazing time. I love the people. I love the weather. I love just the environment. So maybe Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, Dries, uh, thank you very much for uh, the presentation, and uh, uh, we'll see you around. 
All right. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.